Now, South Africa is a, a really important um, player in the higher education landscape. Uh, things are happening here which, which um, catch the attention of people everywhere. Uh, Sir Peter Scott, a well-known uh, commentator on higher education, recently uh, reviewing uh, what was going on in South Africa, said the world should be paying much more attention to uh, this grip of debate which is taking place here uh, and which is pushing the boundaries around this, these discussions of democracy uh, and the role of higher education in democracy is, is, is absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> but there are elements though of what we're doing here which I think await far more consideration, far more discussion, far more deliberation. We need to be brought much more clearly into the loop with colleagues in uh, other parts of the world where there are discussions that are, 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 are really important, particularly for the context in which we find ourselves. We've been able to make, I think, amazing breakthroughs in South Africa over the last, say, ten years around questions of ontology. So these questions are what it means to be a, a, a subject have been uh, pushed and are being developed in a whole number of universities in the country at the moment. There are really interesting discussions taking place around what a post-racial society might look like, around post-racial identity. Uh, there are uh, important initiatives that have been taken at a whole number of universities. And these do bear paying attention to. Uh, they, they, they're not terribly well known, but a whole number of initiatives, a lot of them playing themselves out this year even, uh, have been very significant, I think, for the global discussion around um, identity. But I think it's, it's around this question of epistemology that we're, we're, we're struggling. And, and I just want to, I hope some of you and all of you have read it. I've read Leslie's piece, um, uh, which she's going to be talking to in this, in this collection. It's remarkable. Because what that piece does <clears throat> is, is take this discussion around ways of knowing and to open up this big issue of transcendence about people being able to come at their locations and what their locations are all about, to historicize those locations and to understand what those locations are all about, what Leslie does is to show that there are multiple ways of coming at that. Our difficulty here is, is that we're trapped in this modernist idea that there is only one way. That the modes of logic, of reasoning, have all in, already been delineated. That that job of thinking, uh, and higher order thinking in particular, has already been mapped out. And, and what this conference is, is, is all about is a call for a, a kind of humility to accept that there actually are other ways in which people have been able to come to this thing of transcendence. There are other ways. And to come to understand that. Now, it's particularly important for us here in South Africa to do that because we live in a society which, is, which the past isn't over yet. You know, the past is by no means a done thing. The past continues to be in the present. And we haven't got a language to be able to cope with past, present and future. It's extraordinary. And this is what this work is all about. And I really want to say thank you to you, Leslie, for uh, keeping that flame alive. There are two such projects in the country. The other one is in the unlikely place of UNISA, where a group of colleagues are also talking about development, taking this whole Escobar provocation uh, a whole lot more seriously than most are 
to ask what does development mean and to field the question in ways that don't take us down this hegemonic language of economic determinism where it's only in, 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 in the language of, of, of uh, this old-fashioned uh, notion of, of progress uh, that these issues of the future can be, can be resolved. And these two sites are drawing in people around the world. Uh, they're small projects, they're on the margins, uh, they haven't got the visibility, but they're deeply, deeply important. And so <clears throat> I'd like to say to you that, that I think that we've got here uh, in, these, in this initiative, also in that initiative in Pretoria, uh, I think really uh, important developments which we need to be paying far more attention to in thinking about how to understand social difference, how to understand the ecology of life, you know, how to deal with these questions of, 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 of not only survival but flourishing in the future in ways that are not in our textbooks. But we've got to try and find ways of putting them there. And so this is a great start. You know, I think I come from an extraordinary department and I want to pay tribute to my colleagues um, who, you know, I, 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 we have some extraordinary PhD students, um, not just in this project, but in our department as a whole. And I think much as it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a department to raise a PhD. So I thank very much my colleagues for an extraordinary context to work in and Francis for your leadership. So, and I also want to thank all of you for coming to this wonderful celebration and this keynote for a final workshop in the Contested Ecologies Project of the SOI Seminar. I'm not sure, has Dr. Saunders arrived? He said he was possibly going to be stuck in traffic, so I think he may well be there. But um, Dr. Saunders, I just wanted to, to single him out as someone who's the Africa representative of the Mellon Foundation, who's funded the SOI Seminar and a former vice chancellor of UCT. And um, I, you know, I wanted to, to publicly thank him for the kind of support that he's offered at various points as, as I've had to navigate um, the, the funding landscape. Um, and to thank him too as, as the representative of the Mellon Foundation for his extraordinary generosity. You know, we've been able to fly these extraordinary guests in and, and, and accommodate them fairly well. So I wanted to express my very profound thankfulness and gratefulness to the Mellon Foundation and to Dr. Saunders. I'm also very glad of the presence of Professor Paula Ensor, the Dean of Humanities, who's gone to great lengths to open doors for this project to grow um, and who's made it possible for me to be affiliated to the Africa Knowledges Project in the program for the enhancement of the research capacity here at UCT. Thank you, Paula. And I also want to thank Robert Morell, and Marilette Sinnott of the Research Office um, for their extraordinary support in, and guidance throughout this three-year project. It's meant a great deal to me to have the kind of institutional support that I've had from UCT. And I think the net effect has been that it's been possible to invest the time that's been needed to read deeply from the wonderful work of leading thinkers whose work now reflects in all of the writing that's coming through this project. Thinkers like Bruno Latour, Isabel Stengers, our keynote speaker this evening, Professor Eduardo Viveros de Castro, you have no idea how much we've discussed your work, <laughs> and all of our other guests who are here, who I'll introduce in a few moments. Um, but also, Crane, Professor Sudin, I want to thank you personally. Your responsibility here at UCT is to attend to the transformation of higher education in teaching and research as well as in demographics, and it's a very tall order. But it's one that links UCT to innovative thinking about universities elsewhere in the global south. And I wanted to just say to you that throughout, as you heard earlier, his support for this project has been quite unstinting with institutional resources and with his time and with his questions. And one of those ideas was the question, how do we begin to make better links between indigenous knowledge debates and critical race studies? Um, and character characteristically included in that question his own work. And I think the kind of openness to rethinking scholarly approaches um, in ways that include our own cherished scholarly approaches, including the kind of progressive critical scholarship that UCT is justifiably renowned for in its post-apartheid work um, and its resistance to apartheid, to be able to have the quality of intellectual leadership that's been able to 
to ask questions about established approaches and ideas has, has been really important for us. And it's meant that the Contested Ecologies team has been able to create a space for asking difficult and at times impossible questions about indigenous knowledge movements and claims, about race studies and critical race studies, about post-colonial scholarship, and about science and technology studies. And those four fields have, have been in dialogue throughout this three-year project, which we're now beginning to draw to a close. And, you know, the freedom to ask questions that risk being the wrong questions is, I think, the basis of academic freedom. And at times we've run very close to asking the wrong questions in the very fraught landscape of science and tech studies in South Africa and indigenous knowledge studies, which again I'll speak to in a moment. But it takes imagination and courage and intellectual agility um, f among many members of a university to have the kind of community of scholarship that's able to open these debates. And I want to pay a particular tribute to two colleagues in the sciences and thank them. Professor Astrid Jar, where are you Astrid? <laughs> um, hi. Uh, of marine research and Professor David Gammon of organic chemistry. Um, thank you both for being on the road with us in the humanities, even when it's not easy to de define spaces between faculties and between disciplines. Um, through the kind of work that we've been able to, to do and the kinds of discussions that have crossed faculties, um, so there have been about 18 papers that have come together that are going to be workshopped in the next few days, plus another four or five in development. Um, and these papers, I think, have all been very innovative in, in the ways that the different scholars in relation to their own areas of research have started to try to draw together debates around traditional knowledges, alternative and practical ways of knowing, embodied knowledges, post-colonial studies, and science and tech studies. But front and center to all of our questions in the SOI seminar has been to try to rethink the relationship between scholarship and traditional and practical and alternative knowledges in ways that are accountable to the consequences of the Mbeki's government's devastating attempt to draw on traditional and alternative medicines instead of supplying antiretrovirals. And it's clear and it's obvious, um, beyond obvious, that the devastating consequences of Mbeki's simplistic critique of colonial and Western science stands as a shocking moment for post-colonial knowledge studies anywhere in the world. And I think it's one that compels a response, whether one is working on body and medicine or environment and climate change. And the question for us here in South Africa could never only be framed in a dialogue with decolonial knowledges or indigenous knowledge debates in different parts of the world. Nor could we do a kind of very simplistic science and technology studies that relativized the sciences and treated their findings as a matter of belief or ideology or discourse. For us, we had to come at it differently, and our key question has become, how can one responsibly critique modernist science? And I think it's interesting that that line actually comes from a paper delivered by the Chair of Anthropology at Chicago University, Judith Farquhar, in a workshop two years ago, where she spoke about Chinese medicine in the workshop that Susan Levine convened as part of the SOYA. How can we responsibly critique modernist science? What are the limits of modernist sciences and what do they en enable us to see and what do they occlude? And here the work of science scholars is key, especially Bruno Latour and Donna Haraway and the work of philosopher of science Isabel Stengers, who is published extensively with the winner of a Nobel Prize for Physics, Ilya Prigogine. And the approach that, that Latour and Haraway and Stengers has offered is grounded in a very, very healthy respect for the sciences, a love of reality and a welcoming of the empirical. And the kinds of questions that they ask have been extraordinarily useful in our work. So I want to highlight a couple of them. Perhaps, first of all, to build on my point about HIV AIDS science, they question the ways in which dissident science can make, it way, make its way through into a democratic system to become part of policy. Latour's paper on, on brown climate science, you know, anti-climate anti science work, um, is, is, a, is, a, is an extraordinary piece in that regard. And it, it teases out the ways in which the intellectual tools of critical thought, of deconstruction, can become used against the interests of reality and become a very profoundly anti-critical project. Um, it's an exemplar of, of, of scholarship for us as we as opened up similar kinds of questions. But they also ask questions about the entanglements of the sciences with state-making asking what happens when, for example, the careful calculation of probabilities here on University Avenue turns into a 100% certainty in a parliamentary committee at the top end of Adderley Street. 
And they're also interested in the transformations of knowledge and the knowledge economy and the, ki the kinds of questions that they ask in that area of work speak to the transformative role of capital in IKS, Indigenous Knowledge Studies, in, in post-apartheid South Africa, which have focused so heavily on, on the development and patenting of, of medicinal drugs, such that traditional medicine becomes contracted into TM, trademarked TM, TM, as a different product. It's a very different thing from the thing that operates as traditional medicine in, in many village settings. What does that mean? The kinds of questions that they ask help us to think about the ontological politics that accompany these kinds of transformations. As part of that work, they ask very, very hard questions about what it is to know and what it is to believe. Questions that go all the way back to René Descartes and to the origins of modernist thought. And Bruno Latour, in dialogue with our Brazilian guest, Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, asks about the possibilities of thinking with different intellectual heritages and different ontologies. And there's been an extraordinarily rich dialogue between the two of them over the years, um, which reflects in, in, the, in their respective writings. Um, and here, too, the, the richness of dialogue across the global south becomes apparent. For Latin American scholars like Walter Mignolo and Arturo Escobar, contestations over the sciences in the name of indigenous knowledge or tradition or alternative knowledge, even New Age thought, can be read as part of a broader challenge to the limitations of modernist thought entangled with capital. And for Mignolo and Escobar, the resurgence in traditional and alternative thought needs to be understood as a resistance to the ways in which modernist ontologies offer nature up simply as something to be exploited as part, and think about the ways in which that approach becomes part of the alienation of moderns from environments. But at the same time, as we think about the, as we thought in this workshop and series about, about regional debates on indigenous knowledge, it's become incredibly powerfully apparent that in contrast to the Latin American struggles over traditional knowledge, which focus so much on environments, South Africa's struggles over traditional knowledge have tended to focus overwhelmingly on the body and on medicine or on personhood, Ubuntu, and jurisprudence. And the difference, I think, is really quite profoundly related to the history of land dispossession. After land has been taken away, the body and sociality becomes a foci of traditional practice and innovation. And I think it's, it's very interesting to try to work with that um, regionally. <coughs> but that leaves us asking the question, what is what might be African environmental philosophies and practices? And how might, how might one begin to work with those without making the errors of salvage anthropology? So one of the inspiring things about working in this project has been discovering how colleagues in different regions and different political landscapes have taken on the challenge of writing about diversity without relying on the assumption of cultural difference or even indigenous knowledge versus science or knowledge versus belief or Africa versus the West, these binaries that, 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 that make discussion so difficult in our own landscape. And in Brazil, Professor de Castro's symmetrical anthropology has sought to shift Amazonian anthropology, Brazilian Amazonian anthropology away from simply documenting Amerindian ways of life and thinking to an anthropology that takes as philosophy that which has been generally represented as either myth or irrationality, superstition. To ask some really hard questions about, hang on, is there a way of thinking about the world here that reflects differently on modernity and that offers us different possibilities for thinking. And his challenge to us has been to what happens if you begin to take as philosophy that which has just simply been sidecast as, as, as myth. It's been a hugely important question and it's a real honor to be able to welcome you, sir, this evening and to our workshop this week. And along with Professor de Castro, colleagues whose work is based in Latin American environmentalities, who are here this week, include Professor Marisol de la Cadena, who I might add has just been awarded the next SOA seminar grant to focus on similar kinds of questions in Latin American contexts. Marisol hails from Peru and teaches anthropology at the University of California at Davis at the moment. Professor Mario Blazer, um, who holds the Canada Research Chair in Aboriginal Studies and who hails from Argentina and has worked in several countries in Latin America. And Dr. Laura Rival of Oxford, who's the editor of the Journal of Lowland South American Studies called TPT. But 
just to return to the theme briefly of, of looking at, at um, different regional debates on, on, on indigenous knowledge, it's fascinating to look at the ways in which in Australia, Aboriginal land claims, claims over title deeds, have, um, have, have tended to, to make very prominent in their debates, debates over practices of claiming property, like singing the land instead of signing for the land, as a title of a paper by Helen Viren. And the kinds of discussions there around property and what it means to know in order to be able to claim property have opened up scholarship, extraordinary scholarship, on different notions of land, of mapping, of building, about ways of debating environmental policy that are generative, generative discussions instead of the kind of environmental discussions that, that regret that one knows the environmental truth and I'm terribly sorry but you just have to do it my way because I'm from the landscape of science and I know and I'm terribly sorry but you just have to do it my way um, which I think comes across in many of the kinds of environmentalities and environmental policy makings that, that one encounters in, in the, particularly in, the, in some of the big um, environmental organizations so looking rather for different ways of, of debating environmental policy across different knowledge different kinds of knowledge looking for generative kinds of dialogue um, and this work has been led by our very distinguished colleagues in science and technology studies, uh, Professor Helen Verin. Where are you, Helen? <laughs> ah, yeah, right at the back. And Dr. David Turnbull. It's lovely to have you both here. Also a pair of old friends who've written together, and it's lovely to have you both here together and be part of your own conversation. And in fact, it was part of our original proposal to, to the SOAS seminar that uh, we wanted to invite friends <laughs> who could, so we could piggyback on the conversations between them. Uh, it hasn't always been possible, but it's lovely to have you here. So, okay, how does the work of these wonderful colleagues relate to the emergence of a discussion about environmentalities in Africa? Well, through in, in engaging the writings of our guests and the writings of others, like Latour and Stengers, a range of different Southern African projects have emerged, which will form the basis of discussion in the next few days. These include a seven-site project on fishers knowledge around the Benguela current coast from Stillby right through to Wallfish Bay. Um, thank you, Astrid, for very hard work on that. Um, a project that looks at ways of integrating fishers' knowledge with marine resources management in the context of the decline of fish stocks. Then, without trying to create a project of Zimbabwean studies, we've had three wonderful Zimbabwean students arrive to begin PhDs. Um, and all of their projects have got something, some very interesting similarities. All of them attend in various ways to questions of survival in the context of political crisis and climate change. How do people draw on different kinds of resources to survive the, this extraordinarily tense and difficult mix of political crisis and, and, and environmental change? Then there's a number of South African studies on medicinal plants, well-being, and notions of health, and that fits into the work with, that we're doing with David Gammon. Um, thank you, David. Where are you? <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, and a, another project on urban conservation and Cape Flats nature, Tanya from Engineering and Built Environment, who teaches in that department. And then there's Professor Glenn's project on leopard conservation research. Professor Glenn is from Film and Media Studies. So it's been quite an extraordinary process of, of finding people in different parts of the university who are asking similar kinds of questions. And I do want to say that I think part of the reason why we've been able to find colleagues in different faculties who wanted to ask some tough questions about knowledges and ways of knowing is because UCT for almost a decade now has had a policy of evaluating academic staff not only on academic outputs but also on community involvement and I think that's changed the profile of, 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 of research to such a degree that there are a number of people across faculties who are regularly doing what we in anthropology call ethnographic research um, and I think it's a very interesting moment at UCT um, to see those debates beginning to to impact on discussions of, of knowledge itself. So in the week to come we're going to be workshopping a number of, of papers under three the, all, those, all of those papers under three themes. The first theme is ontologies and politics exploring the ways in which particular ways of thinking about nature and culture are a part of the practices of democracy itself. <coughs> Latour's point is a fascinating one. So the difficulty with the nature and culture in politics is that 
Parliament gets to deal with culture um, and nature. There's, no, there's very little political accountability for the ways in which we think about nature, and yet there's, there's extraordinary uh, differences of opinion that, are, that need to be debated about things like climate change, antiretrovirals, um, marine policy, and so on. So how do we bring the sciences back into democracy is part of his question. Um, the second broad question is this is one of looking for strategies for generative dialogue across different knowledges and ways of knowing, um, including embodied and practical knowledges and knowledges of different scales. And the third one is what a delicious term that I, that, I, that I enjoy very much because it tickles the brain, which is the idea of extradisciplinary knowledges, which knowledges which exceed the possibility of translation into the logics and methods and languages of the disciplines. These disciplines, which the, the very idea of disciplines, I think, goes back to the Greek idea of, of the gymnasium, where you did mathematics, um, gymnastics, um, and music. Um, and the origins of these disciplines, that of the idea that the disciplines were, in fact, physical disciplines, these disciplines, which have now become translatory apparatuses. And how do we think outside of our, of not just, beyond, not just in interdisciplinary ways or transdisciplinary ways, but extradisciplinary ways? So, every single person who's attended our contested ecologies <laughs> seminars and workshops and reading groups, you know, I think what's been wonderful about this project for me has been that every single person who's attended has brought something, whether it be a, a graduate who's never done any um, anthropology before to all of our distinguished visitors over the years, three years. Every single one of the people that has attended our discussions has brought something to them. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, and, um, yeah, well, now it's, it, that's... Uh, I, I jumped my gun. I was going to say my, my last point was going to be about Marisol Soya somehow, but <laughs> I've said that already. So let me just move to... to, to um, Thing again, thank you very much to Professor Eduardo Viveris de Castro for coming and for being willing to give this, this keynote this evening. Um, professor de Castro is a professor at the National Museum at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, who conducted his PhD research in the early 80s in eastern Amazonia. Um, the English translation of his thesis was published in 1989 under the title of From the Enemy's Point of View. Humanity and Divinity in an Amazonian Society. Professor de Castro then went on to become an established authority in Brazilian anthropology and from 97 to 98 was a professor of Latin American Studies at the University of Cambridge. And from 1999 to 2001, he was the director of research at the CNRS in Paris and taught at, an, at, at the Ecole in uh, the, school, the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris. He's also taught at Chicago, and more recently he's, he's published two books, um, both of which um, have titles that, that come from an, ins an extraordinary sense of humor. I remember when I called you in Rio to invite you, I said to several people, I haven't laughed on the phone for so much, and I just phoned the guy to invite him, and I just roared with laughter the entire ten minutes of conversation. But um, there's, a, there's an extraordinary and wonderful wit in Professor de Castro, which has him seeing things in very different ways and very different perspectives. And this idea of perspectivism is central to his work, thinking about Amerindian perspectives, um, which in, in ways that have constituted a major challenge to the idea of nature and culture and have sought to draw into dialogue Amerindian thought with the modernist intellectual heritage that we inherit from René Descartes and colleagues at the origins of, of, of modernity and modernist thought. So his work has been very much central to what we've done and what we've been thinking about. So without any further ado... Uh, uh, this is actually... A, the, the paper I'm going to read uh, to you is actually a fusion of various different papers I wrote in a strongly politicized context, which, were, which was the context of the presidential, the last presidential election in Brazil. Uh, in which there were two, two, three major uh, candidates, but one of them was Marina Silva, the former uh, Minister for the Environment, in Brazil, Brazilian Minister for the Environment of the government, who actually run, uh, won the elections, but with another candidate, which was the chief of staff of the same government. 
uh, Dilma Rousseff has been elected. And uh, I, was sort of, I was actually siding with Marina Silva, and it was this, these texts is actually part of, uh, of, of, of a generalized political debate that took place in Brazil in the last two or three years around Amazonia and ecology and uh, environment and Brazilian, the project of building a big Brazil again which was actually, the approach was very similar to the approach that the military uh, had, uh, what, 30 or 40 years ago. And it's an irony, that a dialectical irony, that the, our president, which is actually uh, a, a former um, freedom fighter, who was uh, put in jail and tortured by the military, is now actually accomplishing the very same developmental project that the military had 40 years ago. Well, that's how history goes. And uh, that's what actually was one of the major uh, uh, points in debate. And uh, the paper I'm going to read actually was, was a reply, most of it, was a reply to a number of pronouncements made in 2008 by the then uh, extraordinary minister, or minister extraordinary for strategic affairs, which is a special minister that uh, which, which, uh, who was uh, the political scientist Roberto Mangabeira Unger. It's a very uh, well-known political, political philosopher and political science that he teaches in Harvard. And um, he was invited uh, by, by President Lula to be his extraordinary minister for, for strategic affairs. At the moment, Lula and, uh, and his chief of staff, the now president Dilma Rousseff, were maneuvering to implement an, uh, an aggressive anti-environmentalist policy uh, uh, that was the, actually the, the policy, the anti-environmental policy of the ruling faction of the Workers' Party, the party of, of President Lula. The main point uh, uh, was then to get the uh, what's called Medida Provisoria, which is a sort of, of presidential decree, which has to be approved by Congress, but is actually it is issued by the president. Uh, also, call, uh, also known as in Brazil, as, it's also Medida Provisoria number 422, also known as uh, the land grabbing bill. Because what's basically uh, um, to legalize the, 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 the aim of this, uh, this decree was to legalize the fraudulent and almost, uh, and almost always violent appropriation of Amazonian public lands by big landowners and great agribusiness uh, corporations. It's just to legalize the de facto situation of, of illegal appropriation of public lands and just legalize it in order to end conflict. So let's freeze the situation and legalize everything which has been uh, already taken possession of by the big, the big corporations and etc. So it was a sort of a le to legalize land grabbing uh, uh, history of uh, Brazilian history as a matter of fact. Uh, the highly publicized arrival <coughs> uh, of Mangabeira Unga um, he was brought from Harvard in order to give uh, a sort of scientific legitimacy because he's a political scientist to this policy was a final let's say insult that forced Marina Silva, the then uh, Minister for the Environment, to quit the government. And uh, since then, Dilma Rousseff was elected uh, president in October 2010, running against Marina Silva uh, and another candidate. Um, uh, well, and then I wrote, this, text was written, this text was written for a, a general audience, for a highly politicized general audience, and it was written you know, so as to be understood by the general public. So it has some, there's a lots of things that would sound obvious uh, uh, to you, but that had to be written because the audience was not uh, well, made of specialists. Uh, I started with a proverb which was quoted by Warren Dean, the great, the late, uh, a great uh, uh, historian of, 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 of Brazil, it's an American. And the proverb is like that, whoever comes after will have to make do. This is what supposedly was said by Brazilian, Brazilian uh, farmers and landowners in the, in the Atlantic, uh, Mata Atlantic, in the, the, in, the, in the seaside forest, in the coastal forest of Brazil, when they were destroying the forest. But this is a book about the history of the, of, this, of, the, of the coastal forest in Brazil. And it starts with this very catching uh, uh, epigraph. Whoever comes after will have to make do. So they destroyed, they burned the whole forest down, and then, well, whoever comes after... That's precisely, well, now we came after, now we are here. And uh, as this, then, um, this is the paper that I, I wrote. Uh, it was, as I said, the reaction to a number of pronouncements, which I will quote in due time, of Mangabeira Unger. As the symbol that the uh, physis, the Greek physis, uh, show, show, shows as one of its guises around last century's end, 
Amazonia has now become an arena in which a decisive match is being played. Uh, the players involved bringing together the micro and the macro political in unprecedented ways compete over the meaning of the future. Now, living behind the dialectics of state and nature, these two imaginary totalities that have, been, that have been reciprocally constituted by a confrontation from which people and their myriad associations were always excluded, either because they were represented by the first, by the state, or because they, they were identified to the second, to nature. Uh, there is a new ge geopolitics taking over exchanging the naturalization of politics for the politization of nature, directly connecting the land to the earth, with a capital E, uh, thereby skipping over the old national territorializations, the geopolitics of environmentalism refuses to entrust the state with the guardianship of the infinite and the monopoly on totalization. Along with the state, nature, or at least a certain idea of nature, must go down as well, ceasing to function as a sort of ontological supreme court and open itself to a symmetrical, political, and multiple cosmopraxis. Geopolitics transmutes immediately into cosmopolitics. We could view things, of course, the other way around, seeing the old and the new. Environmentalist discourse may be read as a cosmology of late capitalism, a sort of re resacralization of history and geography, that would close the cycle opened by the expansion of the West in the 15th century. A sort of dramatic rhetorialization on the planetary scale, on the planetary scale of all those local, national and continental deterritorializations that defined world history in the last centuries. A sort of revenge of totality. Environmentalism would thus mark the advent of a post-enlightenment dark age. Living the space-time of the relations between society and supernature, the discourse of finitude and transcendence would now be articulated in the confrontation between society and nature, no longer supernature, but nature itself. The Amazon rainforest would occupy, in this case, no longer merely allegoric, allegoric, allegor, allegorically, the place of the Gothic cathedral, the sacred canopy, to quote the famous book by Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman, the, sac the sacred canopy can now be admired on Google Earth. And the Ilea Amazonica, which was the name given to the Amazon forest by, by Humboldt, the Ilea Amazonica would take on the shape of the spirit. And society, which not, lo not very long ago was the model of all order and of any whole, would now see itself as disorder itself, as the suicidal ubris that can only redeem itself if it accepts its subordination to a totality that encompasses and determines it, polis must defer to Gaia, to use Greek concepts. So perhaps environmentalism can be taken as a kind of repetition of Christianity, as both subverting and reinvesting, reinvesting in the name of more total totalities and more concrete universals, the myopic imperial abstractions of our modern Romes. With Brazilians, incidentally, in the ambiguous role of barbarians to be converted by the missionaries of this new religion of the middle classes, a new a naturalist replay of the old Protestant ethic. Barbarians on top of that, entrusted with the Amazonian grail, in inadvertent warranters of planetary salvation. Well, perhaps this is all true, but environmentalism can also be seen as a radically new discourse which refuses some of the founding partitions and basic categories of so-called Western rationality. In particular, it rejects the idea that Homo sapiens is the species elect of the universe, either by divine gift or historical conquest or evolutionary conquest, exclusively entitled to the condition of subject and agent before nature, seen as an object and patient, as an inert target of a Promethean praxis. Environmentalism problematizes the theological philosophical concept of production as a last avatar of transcendence, the idea that the human produces against the non-human an infinite movement of spiritualization that opposes matter, that is production as separation from nature. In exchange, environmentalism perhaps proposes an internalization of nature, a new immanence and a new materialism, 
a conviction that nature cannot the name of it what is out there because there is neither outside nor inside. If we understand nature, if we understand nature that way as a certain idea of the real, then nature designates uh, the absolute limit of history. This is the predicament of our era. The, the, the oikomenos, the ecumen, ecumen, has been saturated by, by the human. Culture became coextensive with nature. Ecology and anthropology today coincide. A reaction against the enclosing of the planetary commons. Environmentalism imposes a drastic revision of the paradigms of unending progress and perpetual development, which continue to guide our economic doctrines and our ideological pipe dreams. Our linear and cumulative conception of history has always been blind, structurally, structurally blind to structure, to systemic circularities and reverse causalities. This conception took too long to wake up to the fact that misery, hunger and, and injustice, injustice are not the result of the still partial and incomplete character of the march of progress, but one of its necessary byproducts, which increase as the march continues to move in the same direction. The third and fourth worlds already are, because they always were part of the first world, and they are everywhere now. We went through the 20th century with the mind of the 19th century. The shock is that the future, the shock that, that is that the future prom promises to be hard for everyone, and the future seems to have arrived. The anthropological project, in the wide sense of the expression, anthropological, is in deep crisis. The famous thesis of the end of history and the last man and that Fukuyama, that Francis Fukuyama recycled from Hegel and Nietzsche via Kojev have now ominously moved from the metaphysical to the physical planet. The end of history and the last man are now mere empirical questions that concern climatologists and geophysicists and no longer metaphysicians only. How much hotter the world needs to get how many degrees up are required to produce the last man? Humans are no longer confident that they are the God-chosen species made to rule the earth. Or perhaps they have started to realize that they may have been chosen not by God but by the devil. And to destroy, not to increase, life on the planet. Or at least the kind of life and of living beings they cherish the most. The post-humanist turn that is now so popular in anthropology, and which include things apparently as diverse as the so-called animal turn, ontological turn, speculative turn. There are many names for these uh, uh, things that I would call a turning away from the human, uh, not to mention, of course, deep ecology and related movements, uh, uh, is a telling sign of these uh, sort of major uh, uh, anthropological crises. Let us take the animal turn as an example, this disinterest by, uh, by animal rights, animal human relations, and etc. It's obviously a turning away, away from the human in the sense of a turning towards the animal to see whether we can find in animality, in our shared animality with other animal species, a better way of being human, or better, a way of getting away from the human in search of a better way to be and remain alive. You all remember Heidegger's notorious distinction between things like stones, which are worldless, animals which are poor in world, and humans who are, who are rich in world or world forming. Now that we are starting to see ourselves as having, as having quite irresponsibly squandered our world's riches, we, are, we humbly search and calm the lives of those poor in world to see if they can teach us how to live with more modest means. Being no longer much proud of being human, we seem to be now willing to extend much of our jealously guarded humanity to other species. Uh, of course, the wider we extend the concept of humanity, the thinner it gets intention intentionality with an S, while it slowly mutates into something else. Uh, animals are but one of the intercessors in this process of the mutation of the concept of the human. Let us not forget, however, that such an extension of the human into other uh, realms is simply the reestablishment of a former situation. For what defines modernity is precisely the restriction of that concept of humanity 
particularly in terms of its moral import. Now let me quote uh, a passage by Latour and Emilie Ash, a recent article that they wrote. Uh, I quote, Ecological morality is always approached as if it were a matter of authorizing or prohibiting an extension of the moral category to new beings like animals, rivers, glaciers, oceans, and etc. Whereas exactly the opposite is the case. What we should find amazing are the strange operations whereby we have constantly restricted the list of beings to whose appeal we should have been able to respond. From this point of view, view there is nothing less natural than philosophical naturalism. End quote. This citation, among other things, recalls us that animal rights, for example, are just a small, albeit a strategically important part, of a much wider recent tendency to grant rights to nature at large. Let's not forget the recent constitutions of Ecuador and Bolivia. For once, these poor nations are or were at the cutting edge of human metaculture, because they, for the first time, nature was given was recognized in, 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 a nation, in, in a state's constitution, which is absolutely unheard of. It's a very daring move, ideologically speaking. Which is tantamount, this idea of granting rights to nature at large, to ascribe duties to, hum, to humanity. Animal rights are just a part of the new human duties. There is much more than animal suffering at stake, I think in all this discussion about animal rights and etc. Uh, there is, for, instant, for instance, the question of redefining the whole notion of rights as a default mode of codifying intra-human relational, relationality or of ontologizing sociality or of expressing ethical relationality. Uh, is, there not, is there not another way to conceive of the relation with a capital R except in terms of rights and duties? It's a question to respond to other beings, in other words, to become responsible before them, is not necessarily expressed in a Bill of Rights. What other modes of existence, to evoke Latour's uh, coming metaphysics, should be mobilized to cope with other existence, animals being just the first, uh, the closest, in many senses, candidates to relational redefinition as kind of humans. The diversity of uh, the forms of life on earth is consubstantial, to my mind, to life as a form of matter. The di this diversity of the forms of life is the very movement of life as information, a form-taking process that interiorizes difference, the variations of potential existing in a universe constituted by the heterogeneous distribution of matter and energy, in order to produce more difference that is, more information. Life, in this sense, is an exponentialization, a raise into a superior power, a redoubling or multiplication of difference by itself. This applies equally to human life. The diversity of ways of human life across the world is a diversity in the ways of relating to life in general and to the innumerable singular forms of life that occupy and inform all of the possible niches of this world. Human diversity, social and cultural, is a manifestation of environmental or natural diversity. It constitutes us as a singular form of life, being our own mode of interiorizing external, environmental, diversity and therefore of reproducing it. For this reason, the present environmental crisis is for humans a cultural crisis as well, a crisis of diversity and a threat to human life. The crisis sets in as soon as we lose sight of the relative, reversible, and recursive character of the distinction between environment and society. Paul Valéry famously stated, the poet, the French poet Paul Valéry, famously stated in the somber aftermath of the First World War, that, I quote, we European civilizations, now we know that we are mortal, end quote. In this somewhat, in this somewhat propuscular beginning of the present century, we have come to know that beyond mortal, our civilization are lethal, and lethal not only for us, but for an incalculable number of living species, including our own. We modern humans, children of the mortal civilizations of Valéry, appear to have forgotten that we belong to life and not the contrary. We, and once we knew this, a few other remaining civilizations appear to know this still. Many more, some of which we have already killed, knew this only too well. 
But today it has begun to be glaringly obvious, even for us, that it is in the supreme and urgent interest of the human species to abandon, to abandon an anthropocentric perspective. If the demand seems paradoxical that it is of the supreme interest of the human species to cease being anthropocentric, if the demand seems paradoxical, that is because indeed it is paradoxical. Such is our present condition. But not, not all paradox implies an impossibility. The paths that our civilization has taken have not been at all necessary from the point of view of the human species at large. It is possible to change direction, even though this means changing much of what many people would consider to be the very essence of our civilization. Our curious way of saying us, for example, excluding ourselves from the environment in the first place. What we call environment is but a society of societies, and what we call society is an environment of environments. What is environment for one society will be society for another environment, and so forth. Ecology and sociology and vice versa. As the great ecologist Gabriel Tard said, I quote, everything is a society, every phenomenon is a social fact, end quote. All diversity is then both a social and an environmental fact. It is impossible to separate them without falling into the gap thus opened and destroying the very conditions of our existence. Diversity, therefore, is a superior value for life. Life lives off of, di of difference. Every time that a difference disappears, there is death. Tardy again, I quote, to exist is to defer. It is diversity, not unity, which is at the heart of things, end quote. In this way, it is the very idea of value, the value of all value, so to speak, the heart of reality, which supposes and affirms diversity. It is true that the death of some is a life of others, and that in some sense, the difference that forms the irreducible condition of the world never annul themselves, the, these, those differences, really. They, mer they merely change place. This is what the principle of the conservation of energy tells us, at least. But not all places are equally good for us humans. Not all places have the same value. And ecology is nothing but this, the evaluation of place. Social environmental diversity is the condition of a rich life. A life capable of articulating the most number, the biggest number of significant differences. Life, value and meaning, finally, are the three names or effects of difference. So to speak of social environmental diversity is not merely to affirm a truth, but is a call to arms. It's not about celebrating or lamenting a foregone diversity, residually maintained or irretrievably lost. Uh, that is, an already differentiated difference, static, sedi sedimented, and inseparated identities, and ready for consumption. We know how social environmental diversity, taken as, a, as mere variety in the world, can be used to substitute mock differences for true differences, narcissistic distinctions that repeat to infinity the apathetic identity of consumers in capitalism. Consumers who become ever more similar, the more they imagine themselves to be different. But the arrow of real diversity points to the future, to a differentiating difference, to a becoming which goes beyond the plural, that is, beyond the simple variety subsumed by some superior unity, and towards the multiple, that is, towards a complex variation that resists totalization. Social environmental diversity is to be produced, promoted, and favored. It is not a question of preservation, but of perse perseverance. It's not a problem of technological control, but a of a problem of political self-determination. Vivir bien, as uh, Amerindians uh, like to say. To live well. These days, Brazil wallows in dreams of imminent grandeur, as you probably know. Uh, contrary to the millenarianism disseminated in my country, it's very common to hear in Brazil nowadays, by our, spoken by our politicians, of course, that our turn has arrived. And we demand, our turn for what exactly? Well, <clears throat> contrary to these dreams of imminent grandeur, I am convinced that it's urgent 
not to stop to think, as ecologists like to say, but to think so as not to stop. Uh, it is urgent to begin to think carefully so as not to stop altogether. We need to learn to degrow so we don't decay. Brazil is big, as a local saying goes. It's, very, it's a very common saying in Brazil. Brazil is big. Brazil is grand. Brazil is a big country. Brazil is big. Indeed, Brazil is big, but it's a small world, as we know. So we have a problem here. Um, in, the dawn of the, in the dawn of this century, the earth, as we know, is not at its best. The global patterns of production, distribution of consumption on, and, and consumption uh, of energy by our, own, by our own species are acutely unsustainable. My country is one of the few that still has full viability from the point of view of its resource base. Brazil boasts one of the most historically and culturally most diversified populations in the world. 220 indigenous groups, an immense number of African descendants, of European and Asian immigrants, of Arabs, Jews, and etc. Rural and urban people of the most different ethnic and cultural origins living in a variety of natural formations that in turn are home to the richest biodiversity of the planet. One would say South Africa. Uh, social diversity and biodiversity should be our major assets. But here we are, in Brazil at least, as always, insisting in sawing off the branch on which we sit with policies of international trade that apply a model of development that is ecologically predatory, economically concentrating, socially impoverishing, and culturally alienating. We have devastated more than half of our country in the belief that it was necessary to leave nature in order to enter history. Now, but look now how history, which, with its customary predilection for irony, demands that we make that very nature our passport. I am afraid that we will be found wanting. So, contrary to what the extraordinary Minister of Strategic Affairs, my colleague, because he's an academic, Roberto Mangabeira Onga, has said in a recent interview to the Brazilian press, Amazon is not, as he said, a collection of trees. What, what, what he actually said is, Amazon is more than a collection of trees. It has people in it, as if we didn't know. The people who need uh, state-sponsored development brought to the region, of course. So Amazonian, according to the minister, is a collection of trees plus a collection of human subjects of the state. So it's more than a collection of trees, indeed. Uh, collection of trees, it must be said, exist only in botanical gardens or in the states of the super-rich. Amazonia, on the contrary, is an ecosystem, a multiplicity composed of very conspicuous trees as well as an infinity of other living species, including human beings who have been there for at least 15,000 years. Um, and when it comes to the, to the Amazonian forest, uh, the, the, the so-called collection of trees itself, let us not forget that the Amazonian rainforest is actually a rhizomatic assemblage. Uh, uh, because let us recall that Amazonian, the trees in the Amazon region have relatively shallow roots, supporting themselves mostly thanks to their intricately interlocked superficial radicular system as well as by the enormous buttress, but, buttress roots and feeding off to a substantial extent from their own decaying matter. That is, rather than growing in the soil, those trees grow their own soil. So they are the perfect rhizome of the Lizan Guatahi. They are not the tree of the Lizan Guatahi at all. They are just the forest as such is a gigantic and the largest rhizome on earth. Um, well, this Amazonian rhizome has never been devoid of people before the European invasion. On the contrary, its demographic nadir, lowest point, was reached after the invasion with its epidemics, its methodical massacres, with its forced descents of native populations for concentration around mission uh, posts, uh, stations, and commercial outposts. And the indigenous populations throughout this millennium of co-adaptation with the Amazonian ecosystem, or rather ecosystems in the plural, because Amazonia has many ecosystems, not only one. The indigenous population had found solutions of sustainability that are infinitely superior to the truculent and myopic process of deforestation with chains, herbicides, chainsaws, and etc., used by the Brazilian uh, economy. The Amazonian rainforest was always populated, 
the majority of the useful species of the forest owe the dissemination to indigenous land using techniques. Amazonia is a cultural forest, an anthropic entity. So it was never the Amazonian forest, or at least not for many centuries, millennia perhaps, a virgin forest, as to use it to be called. However, it does not follow from the fact that the forest is no longer virgin, that is legitimate to rape it. Yet that's exactly what's being done. On the argument that the forest has never been a virgin, so everyone can rape it, which is a sort of bizarre kind of reasoning, if you stop to think. Amazonia is suffering a violent process of aggression. And I say Amazonia, not so the so-called collection of trees of the minister. Amazonia in its entirety, its traditional populations and the millions of living species. Rather than simple-mindedly imitating northern European development models, an an alternative model, which puts the largest forest in the world at the center of its equation, is called for since we have arrived at the moment in the history of the planet in which life is the value that is in crisis, both human and non-human life, it is no longer possible to do politics without considering the space in which all real politics unfolds, that is, the space of terrestrial immanence. I use the word immanence deliberately here. Minister Mangabeira Unger has said in a recent interview, another one, that the destiny of man, I quote, is to be grand and divine. Divine. It is not to be a child imprisoned in a green paradise, implying that angels are imprisoned in Amazonia as children, kept there as children imprisoned in a green paradise. And all humans have this destiny of become grand and divine, to transcend themselves. Yeah. All people, he continues, persons, the word he uses, the sowers, all persons, all people, are spirits who strive to transcend. End quote. I, th- I found this uh, uh, idea absolutely uh, m- important. I would say that Amazonian Indians would agree with the minister that all people are spirits. No problem with that. Perhaps they would not agree with the idea that only human beings are people. But that's another problem. Certainly, however, they would not agree with the idea that all people strive to transcend or strive for transcendence. This is an affirmation that would sound to indigenous ears distressingly similar to that which they have been hearing during five centuries since the arrival of the Europeans, meaning the affirmation that they are children indeed who need to bow to the divine message of transcendence in order to become full human, full human beings, to wit, to be good, to be good Christian citizens, i.e., people with plenty of faith and no land at all. Yeah. Indians are not, contrary to what the minister said, imprisoned in a green paradise. Amazon is not a God-given paradise. On the contrary, it's a laborious, co-adaptive construction, a system in dynamic equilibrium produced by, syn- by the synergistic interaction of human, i.e. indigenous, technical ingenuity and the sui generis ingenuities of the sundry organisms that live there. The idea that the that paradise is at bottom a prison for men, for humans. It's a very, there's a very long history in, in, in Western thought that, of this idea that paradise is actually a prison and man actually has to break free from paradise in order to become fully human. Uh, this idea that paradise uh, uh, is a prison, both ideas belong to the old world, both the idea of paradise and the idea of prison. Indians have nothing to do with that we should take them out of the conceptual prison in which the minister had placed them and let the paradise for those who have a need for it, that is, us. The idea that indigenous populations also need to be liberated, the word is the ministers, which he spawned in yet another more recent text that we need to liberate Indians from the pitiful condition that they are living nowadays, seems to me to be metaphysically insolent. Those indigenous groups who suffer from depression, suicide, alcoholism, etc., as the minister laments, are precisely those who do not have land. The Indians of the Guarani of southern Mato Grosso, for example. Not Amazonian groups like the Yanomami, who are strong and happy people precisely for having lands, for still having lands, that fits their vital and spiritual needs. 
The indigenous areas of Amazonia, as we all know, are the least de deforested areas of the whole region. And they are the essential pieces in the process of regularization or juridical stabilization of the chaotic land distribution that made Amazonia, not only Brazilian Amazonia, but the whole of Amazonian region, into the paradise of illegal land appropriation, political assassination, drug trafficking, international smuggling, and government subside corruption. And what does the minister propose instead of, uh, of this uh, regularization based on the indigenous uh, possession of land? He proposed what he called a program of land-only regularization. That is nothing but a repeat of the detestable principle of, of uti possidetis. This is a classical juridical doctrine that says, well, who has the possession has the property of the land. If you occupy a land, you are the, the legal owner of it. Uh, which is the legalization of the private brute force appropriation of public lands by the rich and the powerful. Well, naturally, Indians suffer with various problems. Many of them, problems like alcoholism, well, depression, uh, suicide, and etc. We all know that. Indians suffer with various problems, many of them caused by the incompetence and or the corruption of the agencies of the state that should enforce the respect of their constitutional rights. But it can also not be denied that the Indians have suffered all the difficulties adapting to the socio-economic socio and spiritual forms of Brazilian national society. Because they have chosen from the very early beginning in their history a civilizational route that is radically distinct to our own and which can be called the path of immanence as opposed to the path of transcendence, to use the minister's uh, concepts. Indigenous cultures, in particular, are not founded on the principle that the essence of the human condition is desire, need, and luck. The mode of life, the system, in the most radical sense, is other. Indians are the masters of immanence. What transcendence do we have, we proud Brazilians, the self-appointed representatives of reason and modernity, to offer them? It is more probable that the Indians will liberate us than that we will liberate them, at least in spirit. The problem in some, I think, is that of finding an alternative way of life, because there is no alternative to life. To change, then, the life we live, to change the way of life, to change the system. Capitalism, as we know, as you know, as everybody knows, is a political religious system, the principle of which consists in taking from people what they have and to make them want what they don't have, always and ever. Another name for this principle is economic development. We are here in the thick of the theology of the fall, of the infinite insatiability of human desire before the fi finite, finite, means, finite, fi finite means of satisfying them. The economists are the priests and the theologians of our age. It's not by accident that Marx spoke of the metaphysical subtleties and the theological astuteness involved in the idea of commodity. But it's precisely this theology of development that we can no longer accept, or at least we can no longer accept the equation between development and economic growth. The world of economics nowadays is paying renewed attention to the thesis of, of Nicolas georgiescu Hagen on degrowth, on the thermodynamic costs of the economy, and on the idea that there exists an, an uneconomic growth, which occurs, I quote, when increases in production come at the expense in resources and well-being that is worth more than the items made, end quote. And then I quote Hermann Daly, who is uh, one of the students of georgiescu Hagen. Environmental degradation is an iatrogenic disease induced by physicians, that is, by pro-growth advocates, advocates, who attempt to treat the sickness with unlimited wants by prescribing unlimited production. We do not cure a treatment-induced disease by increasing the treatment dosage. End of quote. The notion, the notion, then, of sustainable development is merely a means of making the notion of development sustainable, although it really should have already been sent to the idea recycling plant. There is no sustainable capitalist development. And uh, 
unless I'm very deeply mistaken, the great majority of the defenders of the idea of, of sustainable development do not imagine an alternative to capitalism. So why they don't do this, why they, don't, why they can't do this, why, they can't, well, why we can't imagine an alternative to capitalism, that's another big question. But uh, as we know, there's this famous uh, one line by Frederick James, I think, who said, nowadays it seems to be much easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I think that to counter economic development, we need to generate a concept of anthropological sufficiency. Anthropological su sufficiency does not mean self-sufficiency, i.e. sustainability. Given that life is difference, its relation with authority is openness to an outside in view of its perpetual interiorization. And interiorization is always unfinished because the outside maintains us. We are the outside. We differ from ourselves at every moment. What is in question is self-determination, the capacity to define to ourselves, for ourselves, a good enough life. As the, the, the psychoanalyst uh, Donald Winnicott spoke of a good enough mother. It's a concept which I love. Winnicott used to say that uh, all, a, all, a child, all a child needs is a good enough mother to have a, a normal psychic development. It doesn't need a perfect mother. Actually, if, he has, if, if it has a perfect mother, it's going to be, yeah, very problematic. So all we need is a good enough mother. And I think this is a wonderful concept, the idea of a good enough relation, a good enough mother. What we need is a good enough life as well. Not a perfect life, not a better life, just a good enough life. We do not need paradise, precisely. We do not need a perfect mother. Gaia is a mother, as we know. Uh, the good life is a good enough life. There is no better than enough. Development is always deemed an anthropological necessity because it supposes an, anthropologic, an anthropology of necessity. That is, the idea that I've already mentioned of the subjective infinitude of man his insatiable desires, is in indissoluble indis contradiction with the objective finitude of the environment, the scarcity of resources. It's all economy is all about. We are here at the heart of the theological economy of the West. We are, at the, we are at the source of our economic theology of development. It was Walter Benjamin who famously remarked that capitalism is a religion, directly a religion, not the result of a religious mutation, as in Weber's classic thesis, but a mutation of Christianity itself. Christianity became capitalism, according to Walter Benjamin. And as Marshall Salins has also famously said, the genesis of economics as a science is the economics of Genesis, the book of Genesis, the idea of necessity and fall, homo economicus and the man of sorrows. However, this economic theological concept of necessity is, in every sense, unnecessary, by which I mean dangerous to the point of being suicidal. What is needed, as I said, is a concept of sufficiency and not of necessity. Against the theology of necessity, we should, be, we should put forth a pragmatic of sufficiency. Against the acceleration of growth, we should think in terms of the acceleration of the transfers of wealth, or the free circulation of differences. Against the economicist theory of necessary development, let us devise a cosmopragmatics of sufficient action. Against the world of everything is necessary and nothing is enough, which is the world of capitalism, we should favor a world where very little is necessary and almost everything is enough. Who knows, maybe with these strategies, we will, we will end up with a world to leave to our children. I conclude with three conclusions, short, three short conclusions. Firstly, with a very pessimist, fantasist note. By saying that I have my doubts that we can escape the ecological crisis created by capitalism simply by means of the, ex the exercise of scientific reason and political will. I have therefore come to suppose that only a religious movement, a sort of post-human, utterly non-messianic utopia, biocentric and geomorphic, could perhaps modify the condition of our existence in a significant way. It is a matter then of shaking the religious foundations of Western culture, and perhaps even of human culture, culture who knows. 
humans must perhaps mutate into another species within the anthropological, uh, uh, sorry, humans must mutate into another species to forestall their own extinction as a species. Christianity was a radical innovation in its time within the anthropological matrix, as we know. It redefined certain basic values of human society. Christ was an anthropological messiah. Perhaps the imminent parousia will bring us a different Christ, a physical Christ, a thermodynamic messiah. Uh, This is a prediction of sorts, not a prescription of any sort. An AI, maybe, a super artificial intelligent organism, who knows. But of course, messiahs are not made to order. And I think it was Kafka who said that the Messiah will come only when he is no longer necessary. Soon he will no longer be necessary. Um, Secondly, my second short conclusion is another fantasist pessimist conclusion. Imagine one of those B-movies, science fiction movies, in which the earth is invaded by an alien race that uh, are disguised as humans in order to dominate the planet and to, to, to plunder uh, its resources uh, since its origin, the old of origin, has already been totally uh, uh, exhausted. Normally, the, in these films, the aliens uh, feed themselves off humans themselves, of their blood or something like that, uh, that mental energy or something like that. There are plenty of Hollywood movies with this sort of plot. Uh, now imagine, let us imagine that this, this history has already happened. Imagine that the alien race that invaded the earth are ourselves. We simply forgot it. See? Let us suppose that we have been invaded by a race, this far, I mean, a, a species, disguised as humans, and we suddenly realize that they won. We are them. We are they. Uh, or perhaps there, were two, there are two species of humans, one alien and the other indigenous. Who knows? Or maybe it is every species as a whole, which is divided into the alien cohabiting, I mean, living together with the indigenous within the same body. Let us say a slight a glitch in sensibility made us, let's say, that suddenly we perceive that there is, we, had, we, have a, we are a terminal case of self-colonization. Or perhaps the invader is the soul and the native is the body, who knows? Maybe the soul has an extraterrestrial origin. We know that language, according to William Burroughs, is an alien uh, uh, virus, from, is a virus from outer space. Perhaps the whole human culture is a virus from outer space. So we would all be, all of us, all humans, would be indigenous, Indians invaded by Europeans, say. Uh, all of us, including, of course, Europeans themselves. They were one of the first people to be invaded by the aliens. That would be a perfect duplication in intention, in comprehension. Uh, and that would be the end of the partitions in extension, meaning the invaders are actually the invaded. The colonized are the colonizers who have woken up to an incomprehensible nightmare. End of the movie. <laughs> and now, finally, my third and final conclusion, a more light-hearted uh, spirit. Uh, in, the, the, in the conclusion to that beautiful paper, that the one I, saw, I quoted by Latour and Emiliage, the paper is called Morality or, or Moralism, an Exercise in Sensitization. Uh, Emily and, and Bruno leave the animal question and move to a far more remote type of being, at the very end of the paper. They recall, at the end of the paper, a striking meditation by Michel Serre on the myth of, what do you say, Sisyphus? Sisyphus. I quote, Everyone talk about Sisyphus, says Serre, and no one says anything about the rock. The myth, the myth shows the continual fall of the rock, yet we notice only the guilty, the guilty unhappy hero working like a slave. And then Serre asks, indeed, what about the rock? If you think rocks do not count, I would, I would like to leave you with this amusing theological debate I just found on the internet, where else? Uh, between two churches somewhere in the American Deep South or Midwest, one Presbyterian, the other Catholic. These two churches were built one, one, one in front of the other across the, the, the street. And you know these uh, churches have these panels in which they have, have messages that they change from time to time. Then they had this very interesting theological debate that I'm going to show you in the...
My dear, your passport is needed. <laughs> as if, as if. <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> no? Okay. Now, this is the internet uh, presentation. It starts with the Catholics uh, provoking the, the Protestants. The Our Lady of Martyrs Catholic Church announces, all dogs go to heaven. The Presbyterians don't like it at all and respond. Only humans go to re heaven, read the Bible. <laughs> the Catholics react and say, God loves all his creations, dogs included. <laughs> it gets more interesting. Then the Protestants <laughs> Dogs don't have souls. This is not open for debate. This must have been invented. This must be a hoax because it's so but let's let's pretend it's true. It may be true. <laughs> then the Catholics facing this kind of, this is not open for debate. Say, Catholic dogs go to heaven. Presbyterian dogs can talk to their pastor. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a sense of humor, the, the Catholics, okay? Then, Protestants, right again, converted to Catholicism does not magically grant, grant your dog a soul. Typical Protestant argument against magically minded uh, Catholics. <laughs> then, Catholics again. Free dog souls with conversion. <laughs> <laughs> then, dogs are animals. There aren't any rocks in heaven either. <laughs> that connects to our paper. What about the rock? Well, Final word, final say so. <laughs> All rocks go to heaven. <laughs> that's the end of it. Well, that's precisely the end of it. Pump psychism is a solution. Either everything goes to heaven or nothing goes. That's the only solution that we have. You see? I, I side with the Catholics. I am a Catholic, by, <laughs> by, by, I mean, by culture, not by... Thank you. Yeah.